Hey there, interwebs. Good morning to y'all, and happy birthday to me. As my gift to myself, this video is going to be all about swords, because I love swords, and you should too. One of the things I love about them is the sheer variety. There are just so many different types of sword out there, and some of them served some very obscure purposes, resulting in some very strange designs. Regular viewers may recall that the last time we covered weapons on this channel, we took a look at the Gooden Disc, a fantasy design that could have existed historically, but the swords we're going to look at today are all historical weapons that would fit right in in a typical fantasy setting. Of course, I could mention swords like the Flamberg Zweihander, the sickle-shaped bronze Kopesh, the twin hook swords of the Shaolin, the whip-like Arumi of India, and the Aztec's proto-sword-like club called the Maquitl, but I won't. You see, all of the weapons I just named are both cool and strange, but they were still ostensibly designed for man-on-man -man combat. The swords featured in this video are so unusual that I can't even say that about them. Starting off, we have what I can only refer to as this monster sword. The particular one which I'm showing you now belonged to Maximilian II of Bavaria, Prince Elector of the Holy Roman Empire from 1679 to 1726. Never a weapon of war, it was intended to be a showpiece, a bit of intimidating objet d'art, which is reflected in its ornate decoration and impressive size. It wasn't a one-off, either. There are other extant examples which range from a similar size to something a little less imposing, and the ones of more modest proportions also tend to display more modest fittings as well. For those curious, the blade portion, if you can even call it that, is the preserved rostrum of a sawfish. Unfortunately, sawfish themselves are not well preserved in the wild. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, lists the large-toothed sawfish Pristis Pristis as critically endangered, so people won't be making new rostrum swords anytime soon, and the ones that already exist require crossing a legal minefield to own or acquire if you can find one for sale. If you do somehow get your hands on one and you're looking for that perfect companion weapon, may I suggest a canine mandible knife or horse jaw tomahawk. Weaponizing animal teeth is going to be a bit of a theme in this video, but more on that later. Another category of fanciful display swords with elements of their construction plucked from the sea are these 16th century sabers with handles made from precious red coral. At least two of these three were made for Archduke Ferdinand II of Tyrol, and although I suspect that the blades are fully functional, I don't even want to imagine what kind of severe deformity of the hand would be required for Duke Ferdy to grip them properly. Prince Max may have had history's coolest wall hanger, but he definitely didn't invent the concept. Bearing swords date back at least as far as the early 15th century, and they weren't created for combat either. As I said in my video addressing oversized fantasy swords, they were made to show off the skill of the swordsmiths, as well as the wealth and resources of the patrons who commissioned them. Of course, there's more than one way to show off, and bearing swords weren't the only blades made for that purpose. This is a lead cutter, and as the name implies, it was made to cut through lead. For a bit more context, in 19th century Great Britain, there was a popular type of activity known as sword feats. These included impressing people with your quickness of hand by slicing through silk handkerchiefs and demonstrating your strength with power cuts delivered to sheep carcasses and triangular lead bars. Purpose-built swords called handkerchief cutters and lead cutters were developed for those feats, but they were so specialized that they would be impractical in real combat. I also included a sword named Lead Cutter in my homebrew D&D campaign, although that particular sword is very much an anime-inspired buster sword variant. Cutting competitions and ceremonies are just about the only uses swords still see these days, since firearms have supplanted them as the de facto weapon, and just as you can have military rifles and sporting rifles, so too did they have swords for war and swords for hunting. This sword was made specifically for use on boar, and it is rather unimaginatively called a boar sword. Before I can tell you more about it, however, I want to tell you about a related weapon, the boar spear. This polearm was another weapon used primarily for hunting, and its most noteworthy feature is the pair of perpendicular lugs which protrude from the shaft just below the head and prevent over-penetration. Snicker snicker. In all seriousness, though, you don't want an infuriated boar charging up the length of your spear and goring you in its death throes. Nobody wins in that scenario. The boar sword is designed with the same precautions in mind. That's why it has a stout bar traversing the blade a relatively short way down from the tip, and the rest of the blade behind it is unsharpened, so you can spot one even if it's missing its crossguard due to the hole left behind and the unusual pattern of sharpening. To my mind, this design is reminiscent of Swihanders with their secondary quillens, but this is mostly coincidence. Both types of sword, however, were used in the Germanic regions of Europe, which is where boar swords seem to have been the most popular. Now, boars may have some impressive tusks, but they're absolutely dwarfed by elephants, and happily there's a sword for them, too. No, I'm not talking about a sword for hunting elephants, you silly goose. Note to self, make a goose sword. The elephant sword was a sword made to be used by elephants, affixed in pairs to their tusks, because apparently the giant tusks weren't deadly enough on their own. 
Additionally, I've seen it further claimed that these swords were sometimes coated with poison as well, because there's no kill like overkill, and there are just some people that you absolutely positively want dead. According to some sources, elephant swords were not limited exclusively to battlefield use. They are also mentioned in accounts of execution by elephant. If you've never heard of it before, don't worry, it's exactly what it sounds like. While executions were being carried out with elephants in Southeast Asia, they were also being conducted in Europe with a specialized kind of sword, rather uncreatively referred to as an executioner's sword. I've already made a separate video about it, and I don't want to repeat the whole thing here, but I figured they're still worth this passing mention, however, since they're another group of unusual non-combat swords. You may also be familiar with this African piece as another kind of executioner's sword, also allegedly used for decapitations. I say allegedly because the notion of their use to be head captives is likely untrue, or at least heavily embellished. The Ungulu, as it's more properly known, is a cultural artifact associated with the Ungombe people of the Congo River Basin in Central Africa. These days, it's pretty exclusively a ceremonial object, and that was probably always the case. Accounts of its use in executions are likely to be spurious works of fiction by European colonizers attempting to depict the native tribes as primitive and or bloodthirsty savages in need of being civilized. The Ungulu was also likely used as a literal bartering chip, and it's not alone in that regard. These blades, for example, are spearheads bigger than most swords, but they're actually neither. They're money. In fact, so-called spear money was a whole category of iron or steel blades used as currency rather than weapons. This practice was somewhat common among certain Central African tribes, and a similar tradition can be seen with Mesoamerican axe monies, which were created from precious metals such as gold, silver, and copper, and various alloys thereof. If you want to see a sword that was actually used in executions, then look no further than the Hindu Ram Dao. This sword is used in the sacrificial slaughter of livestock, and like the European executioner's sword, its large, heavy blade is designed to chop cleanly through its victim's neck in a single, swift stroke. One type of sword explicitly made to not cut through necks is the family of swallowing swords. There are actually multiple different types of prop which sword swallowers use, and they bring varying levels of difficulty. At the very easiest level, there are trick swords which can telescope, roll up, or otherwise collapse in the mouth, and while gatekeepers get a bad rap these days, I also don't consider those performers who exclusively use these items to be true sword swallowers, as their props aren't even close to functional swords, and they don't actually swallow them. At the most dangerous end of the spectrum, there are those people who swallow actual sharp swords, but somewhere in between is a less potentially injurious compromise. These purpose-built blades tend to be made from stainless steel, and most notably, they lack edges and points, allowing them to impale someone as safely as possible. FYI, stainless steel is generally considered to be too brittle for combat swords, but it inhibits bacterial growth and thus prevents infection. The rationale behind the absence of sharp features on these swords is hopefully obvious, but there were historical killing swords which also lacked these features. Late medieval thrust-centric swords, like a stocks and small swords, sometimes had unsharpened edges, but they often had needle-sharp points to make up for it, and many Indian Kanda swords lack points, but have sharpened edges to facilitate fatal chops. Swallowing swords are blunt all around, because if you've ever swallowed an insufficiently masticated corn chip, you know just how unpleasant swallowing a sharp object can be. Speaking of dumping things down your gullet, how about a glass of champagne? There are many ways to crack open the bubbly, but my favorite takes the word crack more literally than most. According to popular legend, Sabrage was invented by triumphant Napoleonic cavalry, who found opening bottles of champagne too time-consuming and fiddly while on horseback, and so they took to lopping the tops off of the bottles with their sabers, hence the name. Don't be fooled, though. Despite the use of a sword in this swanky party trick, you're not actually cutting through the glass, and the key factor in pulling it off is not the strength or sharpness of the blade cutting into the bottle, it's the internal pressure trying to get out. This is why it only works with champagne, or sparkling wine if you prefer to be picky about appellations. A flat rosé isn't going to cut it. What the Sabrage practitioner is essentially doing is striking the bottle at a structural weak point, the lip at the top of the neck, and this creates a tiny fracture, and then the pressure of the carbonation does the rest, taking the crack and ripping it wider until the whole top blows off, all in the blink of an eye. To the uninitiated observer, it just looks like you cleanly sliced the top off the bottle. Of course, because it's the pressure doing most of the work, you don't actually need a saber. I've seen this trick performed with a meat cleaver and even a credit card. They also make specialized swords for sabrage called, not sabers, champagne swords. These are usually fairly short, only about 30 centimeters or 12 inches long, and they also have blunt edges since sharpness is optional. Alright, in my notes for this episode, I have points about more weird and wonderful swords like side swords and gun swords and fish swords and swordfish, among others, but this seems like a good place to stop for today. With thoughts of champagne fresh in my mind, I'm going to have a glass to celebrate my new personal best for cheating the reaper, and I'll conclude this episode with the best toast I've ever improvised on the spot. To health, to happiness, and to hell with all our troubles. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.